Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first quarterly investment feedback for the quarter, uh, for the year. And uh, I'd just like to welcome you. While we're waiting for everyone to join, I'll be going through some housekeeping items, uh, running through some news that's hot off the press, and then running through the agenda so that we can get things going. Um, so from a breaking news front, when we look at our GPS core passive approach product, so as a reminder, those are our profiles three to seven that share the same asset allocation characteristics with the active GPS profiles, but are implemented passively. Portfolio Metrics has reduced our asset management fee on that product from 50 basis points to 25 basis points. And that change takes effect from the beginning of May. So that product is seen as a deviation away from our best investment view, which is the, the active approach, but can be used for very specific client demand. For example, clients that are highly fee sensitive or maybe a client with general disbelief in active management. So you can access those profiles three to seven from Wealth Explorer. Um, product is currently available on the Capital International Group platform, that's CIG platform. Um, we are looking at the possibility of loading it onto some other platforms. So if you have a keen interest in demand for that product, please do let your business development person know so that we've got an idea of, of where to target that product in terms of platform availability. Um, something else from a housekeeping front. So uh, you would have seen the comms that went out last week where we are converting our bond funder funds to a standard unit trust fund. Um, investors will be receiving information about that ballot process from platforms around the 29th of April. When we did our last unit uh, fund of fund uh, conversion, some of the platforms jumped the gun on that date. So just be aware of that. Um, but really what's important to note is, is that if your client agrees with the change, there's really nothing for them to action. Um, it can be treated as, a, as an FYI. Portfolio metrics will be voting in favor of that change on behalf of all these investors where we have a mandate with them um, and that does reach the majority. So your messaging to clients can be really that there's no need for them to take action unless they would vote against that change. We've had a couple of queries coming up um, along the lines of the perceived increase in TRCs of some of our building block funds. Um, one of those questions came up in the last quarterly update that we did. Um, we have a really nice comprehensive worked example on that particular topic uh, that has gone to clients who have asked about it. But really, we made some key changes to our building block funds last year. For example, we moved our portfolio metrics fee from outside the fund to reflect it in to be charged within the fund. So that fee was previously reflecting as a separate line item on investor statements and is now charged within the fund. Separately last year, we also converted our South African equity and income fund of funds to standard unit trusts. And when we did that, some of our underlying fund manager holdings um, went, uh, are now held by segregated mandates. And the way TRCs are calculated on that one year rolling average at the end of a quarter, uh, that calculation is now double counting certain fund manager charges as the, the kind of underlying fund manager fee and as the segregated mandate fee. So they're not being double charged. Um, and we really do see that anomaly in the calculation washing out over the next 12 months. But we have a lovely worked example. So if you would like to get a copy of that, just chat to your business development person. Separately, we've had a couple of queries around the TRCs quoted on our new multi-asset class fund range. So that range was launched in December last year, and the first TRCs were published end of the quarter. And with those funds being very new, and a TRC being a one-year rolling number, it's taken the trading costs on implementation of the, the initial small AUM of those funds um, and extrapolated it to a year. So what investors end up seeing as the quoted TRC, because those funds are so new, is very different to what an investor entering those funds would actually experience in terms of cost. Um, so you can get a better indication of um, indicative TRCs from Wealth Explorer. Um, for, the, for the illustrator partners joining this call, we're working really hard on getting our fees module into the tool um, so that you've got access to that as soon as possible. Um, but we are gonna do a really nice communication on that probably in the course of next week, it'll go out just in case you have any questions on it um, and, and have a worked example on that. Um, in terms of our building block performance, so just wanted to use this opportunity to quickly share my screen. Um, 
can show you here, um, hoping that you are seeing my screen here, um, that our building block performance on our single asset class building block funds is, is doing really nicely. So these are the five year numbers that have just come in from MoneyMate. And you'll see that when we uh, the funds are ranked relative to all other funds within those CISA categories, um, they're performing really nicely. Um, and then also we've, we're seeing some, some really top quartile rankings there, which is obviously phenomenal because the team has some awesome ingredients to kind of cook up the solutions with when they are blending those asset classes. Finally, just from a housekeeping perspective, we've had Tahir and Chandra join our investments team. So Tahir, um, if you've got your camera on, why don't you just give us all a wave. Um, Tahir did his BCom honors in risk and investments at Rhodes in 2013. He went on to work in management consulting at some of the big banks, RMB, Investec, you name them. Um, and he's currently studying towards his CFA level three. And the team is incredibly thrilled to have him join our family. So welcome to to here. Uh, speaking of the agenda thanks, thanks for this, oh uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> speaking about the agenda for today. So we're gonna kick off now with a global market update by Nick Spicer. Um, you all know that our investments team works as one cohesive unit across Joburg and London. Nick's is in the London office, so you may not deal with him um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but he is our UK head of investments. He is a qualified actuary, CFA, and is really well placed to give us that market update. We'll then move on to a global portfolio series update by Liam. Uh, everyone here knows Liam, so he's our mechanical engineer, turned CFA, turned Kaya, turned chartered data professional, you name it. He also co-manages co the dynamic income fund with Phil. And then we'll finish with a really quick fixed income and dynamic income fund update uh, by Phil. He needs no introduction because we introduced him nicely in the last quarterly update. Just from a housekeeping point of view, if you have any questions, why don't you pop them in the comment box as we go, and we'll address them in the Q&A at the end, um, or email them through to your business development person, and we'll also kind of tackle them at, at the end of that session. CBD certificates will be issued, but they do take six to eight weeks. So perhaps don't rely on this session for your current CBD cycle because the FPI can take quite a while to actually approve those before they go out. And we will mail a recording of the session out afterwards. So without further ado, let's kick off with Nick on his global market update. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Kath. Um, how much time do I have? When do you want me to uh, wrap up here? You've got a good half hour. Half an yeah. hour. Perfect. Um, thanks, everyone. And uh, good morning to you all. So I am going to be kicking off with just a quick macro and market update. Um, some interesting things going in on, um, on in the markets at the moment. So we'll, we'll try and sort of cover the big questions in, uh, in this quick, uh, quick wrap up. So macro, we're going to discuss quickly COVID, uh, where we are with um, the virus um, because of course it is a big market driver have a quick look at where we are from sort of an economic standpoint specifically around um, global global growth uh, a little bit around you know what's supporting that global growth at the moment on the monetary and fiscal side uh, and i think you know one of the big questions in uh, at the moment is really around inflation so i've left a bit of time just to sort of chat about that you know it's a big debate that's actually occurring within the markets and sort of playing out you know within asset prices uh, and you will have seen a lot of that actually sort of occur during the first quarter. So that informs a lot of what we'll sort of chat about um, briefly in the second part of the presentation, which is markets, quick review of what happened in the first quarter. And uh, then we'll have a, a very sort of brief chat around um, sort of valuation and some of the views that the, uh, the investment team actually have um, around markets and sort of opportunities and risks um, going forwards. And I think some of those things, you know, Liam will be picking up a lot more with his um, GPS update as well. So kicking off um, here, this is a great chart. You have seen it before from the team, but you know, the FT um, puts us out here and really sort of captures the best sort of the highest fidelity data we have around COVID. Um, albeit a slightly lagging indicator, which is deaths. And you can really see what happened um, during the first quarter of uh, 2021 was we actually reached a peak um, in deaths, you know, at the end of, of, of January. So January was a was a month where there was a bit more uncertainty. There was more locking down. Um, markets were a little bit more volatile. But really, what sort of powered the rest of the quarter was the sort of downtrend um, 
within mainly developed markets where um, lockdowns were sort of starting to work, vaccination programs, and we've got a slide on that coming up in a, in a second, were starting to sort of kick into high gear. And a lot of optimism that was sort of creeping into to markets. And what we saw was just that, um, you know, during the first quarter, you know, COVID, the market started to look beyond COVID a lot more and started to sort of focus on other issues within um, the, um, the, the sort of the global market sphere, um, chiefly inflation. However, we are also starting to see a bit of a, a worrying uptick again um, in, in, in the sort of COVID case numbers and, 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 and even death rates now. And that's being largely driven by emerging markets and specifically Brazil, where you've actually had some hideous um, numbers coming out of this, really sort of out of control and rampant. But also worryingly, you're starting to see India, which is this little column over here, also have an uptick. And that's featuring through into deaths, but actually their case numbers are exploding as well. So it's a story of you know, developed markets and you know, the US, um, the UK, um, even Europe is starting to get um, under control um, with regards to um, it, it, the COVID problems, but you are seeing the sort of worrying explosion. And we are actually also seeing the fact that you know, it has been a massive death. So if you, if you add up all of these, um, these deaths over time, we're now at over 3 million deaths worldwide, which is a sort of a serious number. Vaccinations, obviously a very uh, bright spot here um, in certain markets. So you can see Israel with their um, Pfizer deal um, in exchange for giving a lot of information to Pfizer. Um, they got early access to um, vaccines and really were the sort of uh, leader among sort of um, larger countries in terms of rolling out vaccines. It's been spectacularly successful then, allowed them to unlock very, very quickly. The UK and the US also doing extremely well. Uh, Europe actually lagging, but what is interesting is that now within the second quarter, they are really starting to, to catch up here. So by the end of the second quarter, um, based on current forecasts, you know, the European Union should largely have caught up with um, the, the US and um, UK uh, in terms of their rollout. Um, but what you are seeing again, um, along with sort of the, the deaths is that it's very bifurcated uh, in terms of access. Um, and uh, as, as you well know, in South Africa, there's, there's issues. Uh, but that's also, you know, prevalent amongst other emerging markets. There's less access to vaccines. Moving on from COVID, I love this chart here. And what it is, is it's a quick snapshot, color-coded. Um, the numbers are quite small, but it goes from 2008 here uh, to current dates here. And it really just measures the purchasing manager indices. So these are surveys that go out to purchasing managers, really about employment. Um, and this is dealing with manufacturing, these particular ones here. So what are they going to employ or what do they think is going to actually sort of be demand for various products? So it's a forward looking indicator, but you can actually see this color coded snap here where we are sort of anything below 50, which is a contraction um, is in red, anything above 50 is in green. And you can really see just, you know, what's happened to the global economy very, very easily here. Um, so you can see the GFC over here where you had a lot of sort of uh, contraction that's immediately apparent in the numbers. Yes, this is Europe over here. So the Eurozone, Italy, Spain, Greece, this is the Eurozone crisis over here. And again, you can see very, very clearly COVID actually creeping into the data. Um, and what you are getting now is a lot of green. So a lot of optimism around manufacturing and actually services, which is the other component um, in terms of uh, PMIs, which is not on the screen over here, but that's actually also very, very positive at the moment. So as you're starting to see unlocking, uh, services, which is more person-to-person -person type contact and relies on person-to-person -person contact and sort of mobility, that's really starting to pick up as well. So there's a lot of optimism that you're starting to see in markets. Again, you know, a lot of the reasons for this optimism is that unlike a lot of other crises, you know, governments really stepped in uh, early, supported wages, a lot of sort of benefits, um, direct fiscal transfers, you know, in the US, uh, and that's really supported the savings um, rates of consumers. As a big question in markets at the moment is, you know, will consumers with those really big sort of um, savings that uh, on aggregate they've built up, um, will they go out and actually spend? Um, so there's a question of, are we going to start to see the roaring 20s? Um, and there's some really quite exciting data coming out, uh, which indicates that perhaps this is going to happen. So in the US, this is monthly retail sales. You can see obviously what happened with COVID here, but retail sales are actually really, really kicked up in a, in a truly amazing way um, over the last few months. 
as the sort of optimism has sort of crept back into markets and those stimulus checks are starting to being, uh, be spent. So in terms of global growth, what you see is that um, um, the US is actually forecast, you know, along with the sort of um, stimulus package that Biden has actually put in place, um, proposed infrastructure spending is supposed to be uh, getting back to sort of more or less trend growth. Um, China, of course, has actually, you know, largely recovered back to trend growth and, you know, um, very, very early on with its very, very successful um, locking um, down and then reopening of the economy and controlling the, the virus. Uh, and again, what has been slightly less successful in terms of the UK and Eurozone, um, we were hit very hard, they are starting to sort of bounce back, not to trend growth. Um, so there has does seem to have been some damage done uh, in terms of their, um, their, their economies, but there is a lot of optimism there. And these are the numbers from the IMF here in terms of expectations for 2021 and 2022 growth. Uh, and what you can really see is that there's actually been a pickup on a, a world basis here. So uh, as opposed to their October outlook, um, there's a lot more optimism about global growth in 2021. And that's largely powered by the US. You know, the this, this stimulus that they've actually put in place um, is expected to be highly successful in terms of lifting US growth um, onwards and upwards. Uh, very supportive environment. Otherwise, you've had central banks really stepping in. Obviously, rates are very low, but quantitative easing has been, um, you know, pretty extreme, and that's forecast to be very, very um, uh, supportive on an ongoing basis. So there are no indications that major central banks are actually going to pull back on the monetary stimulus. Uh, again, the fiscal stimulus has been truly amazing. Uh, this particular chart on the right over here just talks about on-budget um, spending by governments. So that's obviously you know, direct spending by governments and then off budget support, which in a large sense is sort of special purpose vehicles and loan guarantees, but other types of support that governments are actually putting into uh, markets. And that really has been the big difference between the COVID crisis and what the response that we saw um, really post the GFC is that there's been much larger government support. Um, same type, sort of support on the monetary side, but actual fiscal support has been a lot a lot more sort of um, um, serious this time around um, and is expected to sort of prevent a lot of the scarring that you saw post the uh, the GFC in 2008, 2009. So that brings us back to, um, you know, really the big question in markets, which I wanted to spend a bit of time on here, and that's inflation. So as um, there's been more optimism around coronavirus, uh, markets have started to look through that as a sort of quote unquote solved problem. Um, it's probably quite optimistic. We know that you know we've had multiple waves, and it's quite likely that we might get um, you know uh, another resurgence, um, you know, within developed markets. We're certainly seeing that resurgence within emerging markets. So um, it's not a risk that you can completely discount, but we do seem to be quite successful there. And markets are starting to sort of um, look at other facets of um, the environment as to sort of where the biggest risks actually are. And inflation is, is, is really the one that they sort of are focusing on at the moment. Uh, and that's featuring in, in terms of how bonds are actually um, um, responding. And what we should see is we should definitely see um, a spike up in inflation um, over the next few months. And the reason is very simple that um, you have base effects. So inflation is a year on year number. And so the, the, what we're measuring against now is really the depths of the corona crisis um, of 2020. So the numbers now um, will look much, much higher in terms of prices because there was so much, um, the prices were very depressed at that particular point in time. So you should get a base effect spike up, um, you know, personified by oil where you had oil futures trading at sort of negative amounts um, just after the, uh, the corona crash. Um, and now that is actually obviously at sort of $60. So you, you've seen massive increases there. Um, and this particular chart from PIMCO sort of shows you what their expectation is that you will see this sort of rapid spike at a sort of headline um, layer level. Um, but they are, and central banks actually in general are expecting that to then come down over time. But therein lies the debate um, that markets are sort of very much focused on. Will we actually see that um, rapid decline uh, in headline inflation, or are we going to start to see sort of um, um, a number of effects sort of cause that to be higher, um, bigger and higher than expected? 
And the big worry, of course, then is if you start to see inflation higher for um, longer, central banks will likely have to then react to that, which would mean interest rates going up um, faster than expected, which of course would be bad for bonds, but it would also be bad for your interest sensitive um, equities, which is uh, actually ultimately all of them because you are discounting future profits. If you discount them at a higher rate, you actually get a lower price um, and that could upend the, the apple cart from, a, from a, a, an equities point of view. So let me just quickly go through, you know, what those inflation worries actually are. You know, one demand pull is there going to be the fact that um, the world can only sort of support a certain amount of growth. And if you overstimulate it and suddenly you get the sort of sugar rush through the system here, um, that you go over capacity um, and that actually sort of that excess demand actually fuels inflation. So that's the one worry. The other worry, of course, is that um, there's a well-known sort of monetary equation. So um, the um, um, value of um, uh, supply of money, so M, um, times the velocity of money, money is equal to the price um, times the sort of the quantity of stuff that the world actually produces. So if you have um, the supply of money actually go up, that in theory, and if you keep everything else equal, would then mean that the price actually goes up over time as well. And we have actually seen a really big um, uptick in the supply of money. Um, and you know, it's, it's been truly astounding. You can see from these figures over here. So that's the other sort of worry that's percolating through, through markets at the moment is, is the sort of excess supply of money actually going to um, fuel inflation and more inflation than, than is expected. Uh, and then of course, there's cost push, push inflation. We, you know, we've seen a lot of um, bottlenecks really sort of creep into the markets um, because of the effects of COVID. And suddenly if you get this unleashing of demand, um, you are not going to be able to sort of actually um, supply um, all of the um, demanded um, um, goods. And, and when you are constrained in terms of what you can produce, the price tends to sort of go up to meet that, um, balance that constraint. And that can also sort of um, fuel inflation. So that's the one side of the argument in terms of uh, inflation and a lot of um, discussion actually being that this is why we have to really worry about inflation. Um, central banks uh, and a number of sort of um, serious market players will then come back and say, that's all very well and good, but there's a number of reasons why we, we actually think that, you know, despite the fact you'll get temporary higher um, uh, inflation, that we don't have to worry about it from a long-term perspective. And the argument really boils down to the world has a lot of excess supply um, at the moment. You know, the world, um, there was a big sort of um, hit um, from a sort of coronavirus point of view. And um, a lot of the ability of the world to produce actually uh, retreated into um, home offices and <laughs> um, wasn't able to actually do um, the work that they were they wanted to actually um, were, could normally do. But as we go out and start to recover, people will be able to do the things that they used to be able to do. And that um, ability to produce will actually expand and will expand rapidly. So a, a classic example of this is just that there has been you know, higher unemployment um, as a result of um, um, COVID. Um, a lot of that is masked by various government programs. So furloughs um, or, or sort of government support, which uh, means that people who have lost their jobs aren't necessarily looking for jobs. So it, it hides in the data. But you can clearly see this gray line over here that there's been a sort of a mass effect, um, certainly in the US, uh, on employment. And that just basically means that there is, in terms of human resources, there is a lot of excess supply. So as all this demand comes back, um, what you should see is rather than prices going up, you should just see more people being employed. So that's the major argument there. It's very hard to actually get uh, sustained inflation unless you have wages going up massively. And it's very hard to have wages going up massively if you have a lot of people that still aren't employed because um, rather than sort of trying to increase wages, you just expand the number of um, people that you actually employ. It's very hard to demand higher wages if there are a lot of unemployed people um, that potentially um, you know, um, companies can actually sort of take on rather than increasing wages. So that's the sort of the, the main argument. The, the other argument in favor of sort of inflation being sort of more subdued 
um, or at least coming back, you know, once we've had these base effects flow out of the system, is just that we haven't seen inflation, you know, up until now. And that was actually, you know, despite having had, um, you know, fairly tight labor markets pre-COVID, um, that was despite actually having had a lot of monetary stimulus, um, not the same levels, but also a lot of excess um, money supply growth post the GFC. There, there've been a lot of things that actually should have and were worried about driving inflation up until now, and it hasn't happened. So there is um, an argument for um, this time isn't different. We are in a, a particular regime and um, inflation should remain sort of relatively subdued. And, um, this is, I think, is, is, is quite a powerful argument, just the fact that we should be highly respectful when we are arguing for sort of something to change massively, that this time is different. Um, it does require a high bar barrier or high bar of, um, of evidence to actually support that. So when you argue that suddenly you are going to get a massive spike up um, in inflation and hence you're going to get a big spike up in, in government um, um, bond yields, um, there is a lot of data that we, we we've been on a very sort of consistent downtrend for a very long time and so it would require something quite sort of spectacular to actually get us out of that downtrend and this is really where we've seen all the excitement over the sort of first quarter of 2021 um when you actually put that in context of what's happened over the really long term here we haven't seen any sort of natural breaks yet so um it's a it's a very sort of um important debate it's certainly not crystal clear but I, I would I think argue that you do need to sort of have a very high um, um, degree of sort of evidence that things have changed and we certainly haven't seen that yet and there are a lot of really good arguments for um, the fact that inflation uh, will not sort of spiral out of control um, uh, in the markets and, um, and and sort of fuel runaway sort of bond yields as well that's it. So let's have a quick look at the, the markets um, as the sort of debate has actually been playing out. Um, you can see bonds with the increasing global um, bond yields um, had a very tough time of it in the first quarter. Sorry, this is the data I have. It's in sterling, but it's, it'll be the same, you know, if you, or very similar if you look at it in dollars, um, given they perform quite similarly over the first quarter. Bonds had a tough time of it. Developed equities did extremely well. Um, emerging market equities um, on the whole, um, struggled. Um, and that was largely because China, which is a very, very big component after having a great 2020 and actually a very good um, first quarter up until the middle of February, actually then really struggled. Um, and this was basically on worries that um, the Chinese um, central government was going to pull back on some of the sort of support that they'd been offering to, to markets there on, and sort of credit growth. And that really sort of affected Chinese shares, which of course then fed into emerging markets. And, and it was an amazing quarter, really, for um, commodities, at least all commodities except for gold, which fell 10 percent um, in, in dollar terms. But oil, copper, all your sort of industrial type um, commodities did extremely well in the first quarter of 2020, 2021. Um, sorry, that's a typo, I should say 2021. Um, it was also a very good quarter for value. So we saw in terms of stylistic um, changes, value did extremely well. That was after a torrid um, 2020. Growth did extremely, um, did less well. So again, it did extremely well in 2020, but actually had a poor first quarter. But small cap did particularly well um, as another sort of factor. So it was really the quarter where small cap and value did um, particularly well in terms of equity um, styles. The other major change was that, um, you know, a large tech names, a lot of the winners of 2020 actually had a particularly poor time of it in the first quarter. But that really extends back to when we started to get the sort of optimism around vaccines. There's been a bit of a, um, I don't want to say rotation, but a sort of a catch up trade where um, you've seen the sort of value names and the, um, the non sort of winners of 2020 starting to do better post the, um, the Pfizer vaccine announcements. And here, as you can just see it most obviously in the large tech names, uh, which obviously did spectacularly before then have lagged somewhat um, post the, um, the, the vaccine um, news in November um, of last year. I just want to finish off with a quick um, positioning statement. I think where we going forwards need to sort of be a bit careful is that um, 
the traditional portfolio, the 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds, um, you know, with a sort of a high weighting to sort of um, the winners of the past decade, so the US, um, is really quite expensive at the moment. And that's encapsulated by this chart here. So it's looking at um, the earnings to price ratio here, um, but really inverted. So the earnings yield and the, um, the, the bond yield and actually adding those two together in a 60-40 portfolio. And you can see when you're up here, that's cheap. When you're here, it's, it's, it's expensive. Um, and so you can see the, the yield on that portfolio um, is quite low at the moment, which just means that that 60-40, the traditional portfolio, um, is actually fairly um, expensive at the moment. And what that really means, um, you know, and, and what's really driving this, so obviously bond yields, you know, are low historically, but also the US is quite expensive um, in terms of really most metrics that you would look at it. Um, it's only really reasonable value versus um, expensive bonds, but all the absolute measures like forward price to earnings ratios, which you can see on the left here, you can see some pretty extreme valuations sort of creeping in. And when you look at those types of um, valuations, you know, over the short term, it's not sort of, um, there's not a very clear relationship between, you know, high price to earnings, forward price to earnings numbers and what you get over the next year. But if you look at it over longer time frames, it's not a great place to sort of be um, uh, investing for sort of returns over time. Um, but there are other areas where it is more attractive. And I think these are where, you know, diversification is, is quite helpful. You want to be sort of uh, allocating parts of your portfolio um, to the likes of value, which is um, still um, gives you some sort of um, decent returns um, or expected returns uh, in your portfolio. Uh, interestingly enough, when you look at the um, forward price to earnings of value, as you'd expect, it's lower than growth. But actually, the forward price to earnings, um, forward growth estimates for value at the moment are actually higher than those for, for growth. So it's, a, it's quite an attractive place to be um, where you are getting something that is cheaper, but actually is expected to do better in terms of earnings growth over the sort of the near future. And the other thing is that although the US is quite expensive and it does need to form a part of your portfolio because it is such a big part of um, global portfolios, um, but there are exciting opportunities outside the, the US. The US has obviously won for a very, very long time now, but on a forward looking basis, um, it does actually make sense to start thinking about sort of international equities and having a high allocation to international equities, which I'm sure is something that um, Liam will go into um, in his presentation. So Kath, I think I am more or less on time. Perfectly on time. Well done, thank you. Thanks, that was really nice and informative. Liam, happy to hand over for you, to you for GPS updates, thanks. Great. Thanks, Kath. Um, thanks to Nick for, for that great sort of summary of the market. There's a lot of noise going on for sure. Um, and I think that presentation pulls out some of the key key topics and leads nicely into the GPS portfolios as well. And, and our positioning as well as our positioning for quite a long time. We've not made any knee jerk or, or drastic changes to the portfolios. Um, so um, I suppose with that, let, let me step into... Uh, let me step into just a quick recap of what this GPS product actually is. Because I think on a number of queries that we've had come through to us, uh, you, you get the sense that um, particularly end investors don't understand what the Global Portfolio Series is about. So we've put together a couple of slides here just to, to highlight what those key features are. Um, and then just after that, I'll go back into the portfolios and talk about how they've done. Um, so from a positioning perspective, um, the, the GPS portfolios, um, are really built around diversification as one of the key features. And to demonstrate that, I've gone and pulled the, the holdings of the S&P 500. Yes, the name's perhaps a little deceptive with 505 holdings there off of, um, off of uh, fact sheets. Um, but uh, you, you take a look at that level of concentration versus your MSCI World Country World, so a nice big global diversified index. Um, and then, of course, the Portfolio Metrics Global Equity portfolio, you can see that we've got a huge number of companies. So, so every client will be exposed to a huge number of companies. And then what that does is it reduces your, your risk to single management um, factors or decisions or things such as uh, single regulatory environments. So perhaps uh, the US clamps down on, on big US tech or the same in China. Um, there you perhaps could be overly exposed if you weren't very well diversified. 
take you a look at the top 10, and this is just stepping one step further, I suppose, and you can see S&P 500 is quite concentrated. Uh, we, we've got, a, again, a very diverse portfolio. And if you go and look at your single largest position, it's only in at about 2% um, versus an S&P 500, 6%, and, and your MSCI country world, 3%. So I think this demonstrates diversification quite nicely. There are a lot of ways to do it. Um, but remember that it's also diversified across um, countries as well as currencies. So not just the, the number of holdings, but of course, currency, which is quite important um, given some of the volatility that you get there. Another focus, and it's really down to our asset allocation, how we build portfolios, but it's a very long-term focus. Um, and by doing that, we're going to extract certain um, characteristics out of asset classes. So essentially, uh, you extract a return premium, um, and then that's, of course, your excess return over cash. So why should you go and take a higher risk asset? Um, the idea is that you should get a um, higher return over time uh, versus cash or, or a more predictable um, or certain investment, such as some fixed income. Um, and so what we have here is the cash benchmarks for the, the various profiles in our GPS offering. This is the USD series from inception, but you can see the performance versus their respective cash benchmarks. Um, and why, why cash benchmark is important is, of course, within the financial plan that allows you to, to build, um, build towards a, a, an investor's goals. Um, but you can see that we've outperformed these. Um, of course, you need to um, make hay while the sun shines. But the basic idea here is that uh, we've managed to outperform over a long-term basis, outperform our cash plus benchmarks. I will, of course... Uh, focus on Profile 7 or our global equity portfolio and benchmark it more against um, all country world index because it is very equity focused. But do remember that that the, the key benchmark or the primary benchmark is a cash plus benchmark on these portfolios. I'll touch quickly on this. It's active versus passive. Uh, I believe I've spoken about this uh, previously. Um, but the basic idea here is that you use passive where it makes sense, where market is particularly efficient, and you use active um, where you believe that there is a high chance of extracting alpha, where there's higher levels of inefficiency in the market. Um, China is a pretty good example of that, particularly their onshore equities um, or their A shares. Um, yeah, so um, again, we could always discuss this in greater detail, but it's, it's very much about um, allocating your portfolio to places that make sense. Uh, an example of that active management would be the type of specialization that we run in a portfolio. So I'll unpack this slide for you in a second. Uh, but the idea is that when you take on an active manager, you don't want a, a broad generalist active manager. So you don't necessarily just want a global equity manager and then blend three or four of them together. You want to go and extract um, managers who are very, very focused on particular parts of the market and are basically in search of alpha in very narrow parts of the market. All right, so an example of that, and, and it's been quite a long-term holding in our portfolios, is Trigon. We've often used them as an example. They're not the only example, uh, but I suppose just for consistency, we stick with it. Um, but what you have here is a full allocation to a global equity, to our global equity portfolio. The dedicated allocation to Trigon is very small. You can see it there, 2.8%. Now, that's out of our portfolio construction, not so much out of uh, conviction or belief in the manager. Um, that's our portfolio construction risk management. But if you now go and break that down into countries, you can see that you've got nine or 10 countries there. So 2.8% of your portfolio broken down into nine countries. I've gone and zoomed in on that over there just so you get an idea of the range that you have. But if you go and expand that further into the underlying companies, you've basically got this thin green, this thin green wedge over here um, turning into about 50 uh, separate companies um, with different economic prospects. And so, I mean, having a dedicated boots on the ground uh, portfolio manager investment team focusing on this feeds alpha back into the overall portfolio and helps generate excess return. Um, and so whilst Kath introduced the passive portfolios earlier and passive certainly has a place in this world, um, but a full passive portfolio is really catering to an investor's preference where they strongly believe that they want a passive portfolio. Um, whereas if you look at something like this, this in our core active range, you can't get this type of specialization in a passive portfolio. But of course, that is down to investor preference. Um, and it's not to say, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like forcing a client into a higher risk portfolio than they'd otherwise want. 
it's not necessarily a, a sustainable way of investing or, or achieving investment goals. Cool, so I'll, I'll quickly go into the portfolio update now and leave a little bit of time for, for Phil at the end to unpack my income. Um, so in the first quarter, and, and Nick, this is very much like your slide, but it's in, in USD. I didn't put commodities here, unfortunately, because that looks great. Um, but here you can see developed market equities are over here on the left, and you can see that returns were slightly mixed, okay? So this horizontal gray line across here is your country world index, and you can see our North America and the UK led developed market equities, Japan lagged, all right? In our portfolios, we do have a, a bit of an overweight, of course, to, to sort of all DM equity XUS, as well as an overweight to EM. Another um, active position, I suppose, if you wish, versus the ACWI is our allocation to global property as well as infrastructure. And you can see off the back of those rising inflation expectations and, and sort of uncertainty of yields going forward that the real assets really started to play, um, play nicely or play out nicely in portfolios. It's, of course, indicative of the economy also opening up. So like Nick said, um, as we went into this quarter, suddenly markets started to look a little further out and say, okay, well, the sort of the world will start to reopen and will start to normalize again. And I suppose global property exemplifies that. Um, and then over here in emerging markets, you can see that, that they really did sort of fall out of favor um, during the quarter, or at least towards the latter part of the quarter. And, and a lot of that was down to a lot of exuberance beforehand. So in the fourth quarter, EM was in favor. Um, I think, in fact, it remains quite a favorite of the market, but there were clearly sell-offs um, in that, along with the rising yields and your, your sort of risk-off environment. And then, of course, your global fixed income selling off as yields rose. Interestingly, um, high yield held its ground. Um, some of that down to the lower duration that you get inside that, that index, um, as well as um, the, the oil type and energy exposure, uh, where, where, I suppose, future prospects started to look a little bit better for those companies. Okay, so now let's unpack this performance here um, of, of the global equity portfolio, the, the Essentia Profile 7. Um, and if we take the benchmark, you've got this beta return, 4.6%. And you can then go on and con uh, do attribution of the excess return, whether it's positive or negative, okay? So the first level that we do attribution at would be our sort of our major asset class allocation. In the equity world, we categorize that as your EM versus DM. Uh, and you can see that we've done relatively well here. So it's held its ground mostly. But when, then we, when we then go and step into the more granular approach that we have, so not just using general EM and general DM, but instead saying, okay, well, let's look at our, our granular allocations to North America, to the UK, to Japan, uh, to, to um, EM Asia, uh, emerging Europe, you can see it actually detracted. So on a beta basis, on those allocations, you're down, you've got a negative excess return. But of course, um, we don't provide just the passive portfolio at this level. We then take a step further um, and, and allocate to active managers. And you can see how we've generated quite a lot of return through our active managers over the quarter. I would like to emphasize that, that we don't measure the performance of the portfolios just over a quarter. It's a very short time period to measure it on, um, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, but it is important to understand the sources of return, and, and this chart does a great job of doing that. And so we ended the quarter up 0.3% uh, over, over the Acqui benchmark. Some of the sources of that uh, excess fund return um, came through the likes of Man, uh, Man GLG Japan Core Alpha. Um, and you'll see a theme running through some of these funds and that they either sit within a value type region of the world or alternatively, they are value focused managers. And, and that fits in with how the market rotated during, during the quarter, or what really outperformed. So this is a very, very good manager. Uh, they've had a hard time of it lately, um, but have now strung together two strong quarters of excess return. Um, just to clarify, these bars that you see here are actually excess return versus a regional benchmark. So because this is a Japanese manager, it's measured against MSCI Japan. Take your step across here, you can see uh, the Invesco FTSE RAFI US 1000. Now that's our value tilted implementation in our US equity uh, block, if you wish. And you can see how, again, has beaten MSCI North America by a good sort of seven or 8%. Now, if you put that on top of the actual beta 
um, return of, of nearly 6%, I believe, out of the US, you can see that you can generate some nice return. Um, and on top of that, you've got the nice complementary performance. So you've got this, this um, value orientated manager in our US equity allocation. And over here, you have Brown Advisory, Advisory US mid cap growth. So we're not trying to time a uh, style performance. We take small tilts in one direction or the other. Um, but what you can see is we've got these complementary implementations within our portfolio. So Brown Advisory being your growth uh, tilted allocation. And over here, you've got uh, value orientated. And there, of course, is Trigon um, following from that example I'd given a little bit earlier. Okay, uh, take a look at these. So if you aggregate them up into more of like a building block, it's quite interesting to see uh, this overall performance over time and, and particularly over recent time. So we know that to the end of March was a very, very strong year for, for um, most asset classes because it, it was just about the bottom of the market a year ago. Um, so you can see some very high returns over the one year, but still you can see sort of uh, our implementation generating positive returns over the benchmark. So it wasn't necessarily just protecting on the downside as the market fell, but also participating in the recovery. And then of course, over the quarter, you can see even though high yield bonds were one of the better fixed income implementations, and again, pointing to the benefits of that granular fixed income implementation that we had, uh, you can see that our implementation also also went ahead and outperformed the, the index during that period. Global property has struggled a little bit, but certainly performed well in, in the, the collapse uh, in the first quarter last year. We haven't made any portfolio changes. So that makes this slide nice and quick. Um, this, of course, being the diversified portfolio, our equity portion being representative of the equity portfolio. So no implementation or asset allocation changes. We will likely, I suppose, in the next six months, um, we'll keep monitoring portfolios, but most likely in the next six months, look to, to a re-optimization of, of these portfolios. Uh, then putting this in the context of local competitors, um, to give you a sense of so the product that's available to you as a financial advisor and how our portfolios have performed versus those, it's very nice to see that with the market rotating towards our positioning that we've, again, performed well. You don't want to have a value tilt in your portfolio or, or a slight um, sort of ex-US positioning. Um, and then find that when the market does turn, you actually don't participate. So again, portfolios behaving as we'd expect them to, um, both on a relative basis to competitors, as well as this risk return separation um, between profiles. And then just quickly in summary, before I hand over to Phil, um, just in summary of, of what I've discussed here, GPS is very much a diversified core holding for portfolios. It does need a long-term perspective because we're not looking to trade in and out of uh, very quick trends and things like that in the market. There were no portfolio changes. Uh, key positioning in case it hadn't been clear beforehand is that we are underweight your US and especially your mega cap uh, US, which is very, very expensive as, as you saw in Nick's presentation. That of course means overweight EM, overweight um, to developed markets as well, but developed X US. Uh, and we do believe and have seen the specialist fund allocation come through in the, yeah, at least in the last quarter, but not only in the last quarter. And then performance has been very solid over the last quarter as well as the last year. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Phil. Fantastic. Thanks, Liam. Uh, Phil, if you're ready, you can take it straight. Guys, don't forget, if you do have questions, feel free to pop them into the comment box, um, mail your business development uh, person directly, or direct message any one of us. That's perfect, too. Go for it, Phil. Thanks. Um, just checking, Phil, I'm not hearing you. We can see see presentation and your video, but no sound. Nothing yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we... yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Got you now. Go Sorry ahead. about that, folks. 
That's typical. Um, okay, great. So let me move ahead quickly. I'm, I'm going to give a, a brief fund update and then just a, a, a fund positioning and outlook for uh, just in general for the for the fixed income market. Um, your sort of spoiler alert, I suppose, is that uh, we've actually done quite nicely here to date. So we're very happy with that. And, uh, and, and the outlook for bonds in particular in South Africa is actually quite good. So just briefly, uh, again, uh, Liam and myself managing the fund with Ricardo, who's been with me for the last seven odd years. Uh, and this is a continuation of the strategy which we've, we've managed for, for a number of years. Um, just quickly, the, the, the fund itself has really our main objective in this fund is to try and provide high level of income uh, with, with a high degree of capital preservation as well. It fits somewhere between an income fund and a bond fund. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is, is kind of give you a, an all bond type return with less volatility. And, and where that's quite powerful for investors that, that use a product like this or use a fund like this is it, it gives you an extra risk budget that you would otherwise not, uh, not have access to. So in other words, if we can give a, a similar return to a, a slightly riskier asset class like the All Bond Index, uh, then we can have a much better return overall. Have we lost my screen here? Uh, we've got you, we're just not seeing your screen, Shane. Oh, sorry, everyone. There's, uh, it's one of those moments here. Let me try again. Uh, we just need to see your presentation screen. So we're seeing the full slide deck. And now? Got you. Sorry, yeah, everyone. Okay, great. So, so as I was saying, basically, we're trying to give you a, a similar return to the all bond index, but with, uh, with less volatility. And you know, over time, it's important to understand in the South African and fixed income environment in particular, when we talk about an all bond index, there's only 20 odd bonds in the all bond index. So you're not getting a, a very diversified exposure, but there's over 1800 bonds in the JSE. And, and that, that actually gives us opportunities outside of the all bond index to look to add value. But there's also probably only 40 or 50 bonds which we would like exposure to. So we don't want exposure to everything, but we also don't only want exposure to the all bond index. So really what we're doing here is we're giving investors exposure to types of instruments that you can't actually buy with your own money, no matter how much money you've got. You know, an equity fund, if you see the top 10 holdings, you can go and replicate that. Uh, in a bond space, you actually can't do that. Uh, it's, it's almost a very much a closed market. Uh, and we don't buy equity, we don't buy property, and we don't take foreign exchange risk. And then the fund is Reg 28 compliant. So over time, we've been able to do that quite successfully. Uh, interestingly, if I actually just flip forward one slide further, over the last year, um, bonds have actually had a great year, it looks like. But of course, when we leave out March last year, uh, the, the all bond index had a drawdown between March into April of actually 19% from its worst point, uh, from its highest to its lowest point. So it had a, it was down 10% last year in, in March. Um, so th this shows that the bonds have done very nicely. But very importantly, over time, in terms of the way we've managed the strategy, Ricardo and myself, uh, and now added on the, the portfolio metrics portfolio, uh, we've been able Able to do what we're trying to do quite successfully uh, and the question which i'll answer just now is, is can we continue to do it of course is is really an important one um, so how's the fund done so far um, and uh, this is quite interesting showing us versus so the peers and some of the peers out there to the end of march uh, if we look at it on a table basis it's actually been a very very interesting year because the all bond index started very very strongly at the start of the year and then to the end of march in march it actually fell two and a half percent so uh, what we were very chuffed with is that the the, the index fell two and a half percent but we managed to be pretty much flat for that month um, and then year to date, we were able to stay, despite that big drop down in the bonds, uh, we were able to stay with our, just slightly ahead of the peers. Now, we've rolled this forward to the end of last week, uh, and there's been quite a strong recovery in the bonds. And this is one of the, the points I generally tend to make is that bonds, when they do fall, they recover quite quickly. So what we're trying to do is, is give you that combination of the two. So we've bounced back very nicely here, uh, and you can see pulled ahead of these are some of the peers in the background um, and some of the, the ones that are obviously most important, particularly when measuring ourselves against. And you can see now year to date, uh, we're very happy that we've been able to keep ourselves about a percent ahead of the peers and about a percent ahead of the all bond index, which of course is not something we're promising to be able to do in the future, um, but it is something that just demonstrates that the continuity of what we've been doing for, for many, many years, uh, we've been able to continue to do in this environment. 
and then the big question is, well, you know, what's going to happen going forward? You know, you know the irony is, is that bonds, if you look on this slide, have actually beaten this. This was uh, this was to the to the end of March. You know, bonds have beaten the stock market by a mile, um, by more than double over the last over the last five years. Uh, and you can see in terms of the strategy we've been managing, it's done a little bit better than that. Um, but bonds actually haven't done well. Uh, and this is quite an important point to understand the outlook from here. Even though bonds have beaten equities, equities have just been very poor, particularly in a South African context. And then you can see property here, which is down over 9% per year over five years. Now, if we go and invest in bonds at any given point in time, and bonds at the end of the day are a bit like fixed deposits. So you, you, you enter at a certain uh, yield, and that is largely the return you're going to get over the next five years. And you can see at any point when you bought bonds, along this line, this is the five-year annualized return you got on this line here. And if you bought bonds at these levels right now, what you can see is that your returns tended to be in the range that we are right now, which is actually a little bit above in this sort of range here, is roughly about 10% per year is what you'd expect out of the all-bond index. Now, we obviously are looking at bonds that are more attractive, we believe, than the all bond index in general, um, both on a risk and a return basis. But you can see your worst case scenarios um, on, an, on a five-year basis tend to still be what are right now roughly around inflation plus five, inflation plus four returns, which is normally what you'd expect out of the stock market. So really with bonds, your forward returns are quite easy to forecast because at the end of the day, they provide you a fixed return. So we are not 100% invested into fixed rate bonds in the portfolio as yet. Um, we're still only about 30%. But um, what we're finding though is that area of the all bond index, there are some very attractive points. And this is really the story, is that over the, the dark blue line here is the yield curve, which are just the forward rates of, of the, uh, that are available, effectively your forward fixed deposit rates in South Africa. And you can see over the, a year ago, just before COVID, this is what the kind of rates you could get. You could get just over 6% from cash, and you were getting just under 10% from the longer bonds. What we've seen post-COVID is that the shorter dated bonds, the shorter dated interest rates have dropped dramatically as interest rates have fallen, but the longer dated rates are actually higher. Now, what this means is that South African longer dated bonds, so the middle is less attractive. You know, it's a bit like you've got your, your, your head in the oven and your feet in the freezer, and, and here's the average in the middle. And the longer dated bonds are offering very, very attractive yields. And I would actually argue probably one of the only risk, risky assets, if we can call bonds risky, uh, much less risky than equities. But as a risk on asset, our bonds are probably one of the only assets in the world that haven't rallied significantly since the corona crash last year. So they're still actually cheaper. So where global equities are more expensive, our bonds are actually much cheaper than they were. It comes with additional risk and there's reasons for it. Um, but they are much cheaper. And this creates a very, very attractive opportunity for us. So if we look at what we've seen at the moment, we've seen cash rates. This is the forward returns and the forward risk expectations from effectively the peers in the market. We've seen cash rates remaining lower for longer. Uh, as Nick pointed out earlier, I don't have many economic slides here, but really the environment is, is such where locally and globally interest rates are probably likely to stay at lower levels. The longer dated bonds are giving you a much higher return than even the average or bond index uh, returns and in particular cash. So what we're finding here is the all bond index is not a great index to move into. Um, we're finding much better active opportunities. And the sweet spot really lies here with less volatility, with a similar sort of yield than we're getting out of the bond market. So it creates this, this, this strangely shaped efficient frontier in South Africa. So while the outlook for local equities and property uh, is not actually bad, um, the, the kind of returns we're getting out of the lower risk asset like bonds just make it a much more attractive proposition. So the bonds and, and credit combined are giving us a high income yield and less capital volatility if we combine the two. So really this is just showing you roughly the kind of rates we can get in south africa at the moment if you if you go to a, if i take 100 million rand to one of the banks i'll get roughly about three percent on call at the moment uh three month fixed deposits are around 3.6 12 months around 4.6 uh, a floating rate bond at the moment this is a standard bank floating rate bond is giving us a five-year bond is giving us just under five percent but the equivalent from standard bank in a fixed rate bond is giving us about seven percent 
And then the Standard Bank 10-year bond is giving us around 8%. And while there's been a lot of talk around uh, fixed rate bonds being more risky than floating rate bonds, uh, any of you on the call here would be quite happy to take Standard Bank's credit risk. Uh, and if you're getting an extra 2.5% nearly for, by taking the fixed rate exposure from Standard Bank rather than the floating rate exposure, that's effectively 2.4% alpha that you're getting by actually not taking much more credit risk. You take a more, more volatility because the bond value jumps around a bit. But at the end of the day, it's a five-year fixed deposit that you're getting from Standard Bank. And then the extra one and a half from the, ex, from the extra five years, uh, it, it adds a huge amount of value. So effectively, you're getting nearly 4% more um, by taking the fixed rates exposure and five years longer from Standard Bank. Now, if we roll that forward to government bonds, you, you're getting 9%. And in the longer dated government bonds, roughly around 11, they've just dropped below 11 again. Uh, we bought a lot of the government bonds at, <clears throat> excuse me, around 11 and a half uh, uh, last month. And uh, now those are just trading below 11 again. So it's done quite nicely for us. Now, what this means, if you, if you try to generate a 7% kind of return for a client with a, a 10 million Rand portfolio, <clears throat> you can effectively take half of the money and put it in floating rate bonds. You can take about uh, a third of the money and put it in cash and or sorry, around about 10% in cash. And you can put about a third of the money in fixed rate bonds and generate a return given off those interest rates of around about seven. So it's not really rocket science, but it gives us a great opportunity right now to, to generate a return that's actually inflation plus four of current levels uh, out of just relatively low risk investments. So currently positioning wise in the fund, we're sitting with a, a yield of uh, over eight, about 8.6 gross return, just 8.66 and a duration, which is about a third. So our interest rate volatility is about a third of the all bond index, um, but our yield is a little bit lower than the all bond index. Uh, so what we've really done is we've, we're sitting with a, uh, about a 40% equivalent uh, interest rate volatility, but with a yield that's quite similar. So if you look here as well, you'll see that our bond rate, we've increased our bond exposure to 32%. We dropped in the middle of March to around 18%. So we, we almost doubled that exposure in March as yields got very attractive. But we don't want to invest 100% into fixed rate bonds yet. There's still a lot of trouble in South Africa. There's a lot of risk in the world as well as we come out of coronavirus. And the, the nice high rates that we're able to lock in on the longer dated bonds actually allows us to take less risk elsewhere in this portfolio and across our asset allocation as well. So we, we keep a lot of liquidity available, which allows us to, to be flexible like last month where we were able to literally double our exposure to bonds in the portfolio at a very short space of time. When, when their sell-off happened, it's a very nice situation to be in. So we're finding a lot of attractive opportunities in the market uh, and the time will come to hold a lot more of the fixed rate bonds, but there's still a lot of risk out there in the market. So we, we don't believe that time is, is here yet. So overall, just to in conclusion, uh, Nick's pointed out as well that you know, globally interest rates and locally, because we're so influenced by what happens lo uh, uh, locally, interest rates are probably, even though we've seen a spike of inflation, it's likely to fade away, um, which back to sort of more normal levels, which is likely to allow central banks to keep their rates lower. Um, the, the all bond index is not a great benchmark. So the movement for investors from, from a cash or income funds into a, a bond uh, uh, benchmark or passive bond in particular is not a great move because it's not an efficient way. We believe there's a better way to, to manage that benchmark. Um, we well positioned to take advantage of this current environment. So the, the nature of how we barbelled where we're holding lots of cash and liqu liquid and floating rate bonds and then some nice decent chunk in the fixed rate bonds really gives us the comfort to, to take advantage of what's changing in the market. Uh, and we're steadily increasing the, the exposure to more and more of the fixed rate bonds, but just not yet. There's no need to be too greedy at this stage. And, and really in this environment, uh, it's so important to have a dynamic approach. So, so this, this fund at the end of the day is an asset allocation portfolio because we're allocating between the different types of fixed income assets available. And it's really important to be dynamic and to be able to take advantage of opportunities in this low interest rate world. So there, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If there's, there's any questions, I'll, I'll be very happy to take those questions. Thank you for that, Phil. Yeah, so I mean, 
we had scheduled an additional 10 minutes from here to take questions. So if anyone would like to stay on and, and ask a couple of questions, you're welcome to join us. If you are leaving us, thank you for making the time for us this morning um, and for the team to take us through those couple of topics. We've got, we've got the quiet lots on today. <laughs> If there aren't any questions that come up and you think of something later on in the day that pings, don't, um, don't hesitate to email it through to your business development person that you're used to dealing with or directly to Phil and team. They're happy to take those questions as they come up. Okay. Well, I think let's call it there then. I look forward to seeing you all at the next one. And, um, and yeah, thanks for taking the time out this morning.